Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 240. Don't let your circumstances control you. You change your circumstances. Jackie Chan. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content, and you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Black Box, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Black Box takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Unknown is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post-sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley, ADR, and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post-sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. Now, today's guest is Heather Hale. She is the author of How to Work the Film and Television Markets. And it's so important if you are trying to sell your movie independently and you are an independent filmmaker to understand the film and television markets. And AFM is one of them. The Cannes Film Market is another one. And we talk about all the other, not only film markets, but television markets as well. A lot of filmmakers are not just creating independent films but they're also creating independent television series and streaming series and these television markets are where you go to sell those as well so heather literally wrote the book on it and how to maneuver within these markets and i sit down and really dig in and and beat her up a little bit about what we need to know about the markets and just dig in to get as much information as i could out of her for this episode so without any further ado please enjoy my conversation with heather hale I'd like to welcome to the show Heather Hale. Thank you so much for being on the show, Heather. Um, It's my honor. Thanks for having me, Alex. So before we get into it, I really want to know, how did you get into this crazy business? Oh, gosh. People always ask your break-in story, and you probably know as well as anyone, we all have like five. Because how many times do we have to break back in? And, you know, you can never yes. rest on your laurels. And so I don't even know which one, you the know. Fir- the first one. Let's just start with the very beginning. I don't even know what the first one is. I will say the um, who knows. But th- what most people look at is my break in was the Courage to Love, which was a Lifetime original movie. Mm-hmm. And the speed version to that was my aunt passed away. So this is a to- total Hollywood story. So. Mm-hmm with, you know, dog groomers and hairdressers. Oh, God. <laughs> um, my aunt passed away sure. and my parents became executors of her uh, trust. And they, we became, uh, we had to handle a, a townhouse in Pasadena. And foolishly, I didn't grab it because, you know, I wanted to live in LA, not Pasadena. Oh, and um, Very so foolishly. <laughs> I'm such an idiot. I'm such I would have taken that and ran. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I, I appreciate that now. Gorgeous garden, jacuzzi. Oh, like, I'm an idiot. Okay, we've established I'm an idiot. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, we became executives of our trust and my parents couldn't afford to debt service that and their own mortgage and all that. So we had to rent it out and we had to rent it out ASAP. And so we're literally like packing up the garage of a woman who never moved in 40 some odd years Mm -hmm. while we're grieving, while we're dealing with the wake and all of that, while there's a moving truck with the other people moving in. Like it was that crazy. So as I'm moving bankers boxes out and the new renters are moving bankers boxes in, they, one of the wife says, Hey, I've got a great idea for that would make a terrific movie. I understand you're a screenwriter. And how many times have we all heard that? Like every, hey, I have an idea. You do all the work. 
and you use all your relationships and resources and we'll split the profits and probably I'll sue you for stealing it. Like it's just never (laughs) works out. But I sat her down and I said, okay, like I don't want to do this, but let's do it because I'm an idiot. Mm -hmm. We've established. And we literally sat there with um, a plate of brownies and iced tea. And I handed her a legal pad of paper and a pen and I said, let's write a deal memo. And I want it in your handwriting. So we can't say you didn't know what this was. And we wrote out this deal memo. <laughs> and I was really careful. She claimed that her son was Vanessa Williams' music producer. And how many times have we heard people oh, say, oh, I can get it to so-and-so. Oh, I can do this. Yes, yes, so yes. I had her put, you know, my name is XYZ. Heather is XYZ. My son is Vanessa Williams, music producer, and she put his name in there, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I will get this script to Vanessa Williams. Like, that's that that piece mm-hmm. was what made me do it. And so then I told her I would mentor her and help her and support her, and she wanted to write it, and I was just going to help her as a friend from the sidelines. And so over the next three months, I read and read. I'm a research junkie. You know, most writers mm-hmm. are versus readers. So I knew everything about New Orleans in the 1830s. And this woman is amazing. This is the first um, African-American nun ordained by the Catholic Church. So it's a really powerful story. And over the three months, she wrote back and faxed me. This tells you how old it was. Right. <laughs> faxed, me, faxed me like five pages describing a room. Mm-hmm. And that's as much as she had done in three months. And uh, she begged me, Heather, can you please write this? Uh, and I said, okay. And so I wrote this outline and we got the outline to Vanessa Williams. She kept her word. She was good to her word. And then Vanessa Williams got it to uh, Emily, oh gosh, Gershon mm-hmm. at William Morris at the time. And Emily called me. We had sent her a five page outline, which bear in mind was really well researched. It was historically accurate adaptation. It was a powerful story. Mm-hmm. And uh, we sent it to her and my associate in her zeal and enthusiasm. I don't want to say lied, mm-hmm. but eagerly told her, wait till you read the script. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And of course, there was no script. Well, of course. Right. It's just an outline, just a five page treatment of what the beat outline was really well written and mm-hmm. in prose, really, really engaging of what we were going to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. And so I get a call from Emily Gerson Sains, who says, uh, I understand this script. No, I didn't get a call. I was told uh, Emily wants to see the script. She and Vanessa are going to be at the Cannes Film Festival in 10 days. So could you send it to him? Sure. And there it was a God moment. And I literally picked up the phone before I had time to think and quit my job. Wow. And I told my boyfriend, I'm not leaving this computer until I have that script done. Like, this is my break. It was scary as all get out. And I called Emily, which was very terrifying. It's like one of the first people I've ever called was like the head of William Morris, who's waiting for a script that's not written from me. Mm -hmm. And I gently said, so... How firm is that date? Is that deadline? <laughs> and she goes, she goes, oh, bless her heart, bless her heart. Oh, honey, it's not firm, not firm at all. I, I love the project. Vanessa loves the project, and Vanessa and I are going to be in Cannes at the same time, loving the project. So <laughs> I'm not sure when that will occur again when the two of us will be together <laughs> interested in your project. <laughs> At that moment, we will be. And so I went, okay, thanks. And got off the phone. What? And, I, and then I realized <laughs> I didn't have 10 days. I had nine because I had FedEx it. Sure. Right? Got to get there. Sure. So I literally wrote and wrote and wrote. And then I would hit print, fall asleep. My boyfriend would read. I had girlfriends, people, writers group. So I would like, email them the 12 pages I'd written. I would email them the 17 pages I'd written. I, I would sleep and then I would wake up and I'd get back at it and I would put in people's notes, fix all the typos, keep cranking. So I had literally copied the treatment, threw it into final draft, first script I'd ever written and just went for it. Mm -hmm. And it got set up. 
Wow. And it aired. It was a five and a half million dollar feature on Lifetime in 2000. And then, you know, I had to break in all over again. But let's call that my break. <laughs> wow. That's uh, that was the yeah. most passive aggressive way of saying the deadline <laughs> is the deadline. <laughs> right. But, but but good for her because it was true. No. And you know like, what? And you know what? That, yeah. But that description that for people listening, that that description of how she uh, she spoke to you. Beautiful. Is exactly how yeah. people in LA talk at, yeah. in those positions. They'll, yeah. they'll generally they'll never speak, say no. <laughs> they'll generally never say no. They're generally never like they are, there are the, you know, the Ari Golds of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are, but, but a lot of them will do this kind of passive aggressive yeah. talk. And it's, yeah. and it's, and it's honestly an art form. It's an it, art I'm, form. It's like on my vision board to be unflappable and if you ever, if you've listened to Shonda Rhimes' latest book, I listened to it on audio tape. I love to listen to like Tina Fey and Amy Schumer, all their sure, books, sure, sure. Andy Kalin on when they narrate on their audio books. Uh-huh. But, um, so listening to Shonda Rhimes, which was awesome. I, you know, she coined the word badassery. She said, you know, they say it's not a word unless it's in a dictionary, mm-hmm. but in my Microsoft word, I right clicked and added it to my dictionary. <laughs> so it's a word. So I have like, unflappable badassery on my vision board. That's yeah. my goal is to be able to not cuss and swear, not raise my voice, not lose my temper, but say so eloquently. And maybe it's passive aggressive, but it, it is an art form. Mm-hmm. Exactly what you mean and still be smiling and look like you're being courteous and such a team player when you're really laying down the bottom line. Mm-hmm. And that is an art form in, in this yeah. time without question. Yeah. So, so let's talk about uh, markets, film markets, television markets. That's one of your expertises. Which it all started there, right? Because right. I had to get it to can. <laughs> you had to get it to can, exactly. Yeah. So can you explain to the audience um, what the difference is between film festivals and film markets? Sure. I think that's actually one of the least understood and even people who have been in the business forever because you'll have people say, and it's funny, I never know whether it's can or con because I get corrected. No matter how I say it, someone's mm-hmm. going to correct me. So mm-hmm. Um, they'll say they're going to Cannes, but are they going to the festival or the market? Because Mm -hmm. the festival and the market are on opposite sides of the croisette, you know, Mm -hmm. this promenade. And they're going on at the exact same time. And people can fly around the world and realize that they have credentials. They've paid two or three thousand dollars in airfare and they're at the festival when they meant to be at the market. Oh my god. Can you and everybody they want or or worse. I mean, at least that you can probably jerry rig. But what if you're in the wrong city at the wrong week? Mm-hmm. If you meant to go to the Berlin, you know, the, you meant to go to the European film market and you ended up at Berlin Ale, and, you know, and or you're at the different the TV markets and you're in the wrong week. And everybody you paid three thousand or five thousand to go see is not even there. Wow. And yeah, so I think it's really important. So, uh, so, so real clearly, like festivals, we were talking about Sundance before we went live. Fest, uh, if you think of show business, you can think of the festivals as the show mm-hmm. and markets as the business of the entertainment industry. Great analogy. Because festivals are open to the public usually. They're all about audience enjoyment. They're all about the craft. They celebrate the love of the art. Um, it can be about a specific genre or locale, and it's all about community. So film fans and TV lovers from the public can come and enjoy premieres, fun parties. They can vote, uh, you know, especially for audience awards. But these competitions are curated by taste-making gatekeepers, mm-hmm. and they award prizes based on their judgment of quality. Mm-hmm. And the audience response and critical reviews is what everybody's looking for. And that's what can launch these surprise breakout hits or dash the hopes of what everyone thought was going to be a winner. Mm-hmm. And as you know, there are no prizes at markets. Right? <laughs> no, the only prize is a check. <laughs> There's no prizes, right? And the press are often blocked from the screenings because they don't want spoilers leaked. So markets are the entertainment industry's trade shows. And like everything else in show business, they tend to be more glamorous, faster paced, and more intimidating than any other business sector. And so these markets, getting on the market floor is typically restricted to accredited industry professionals. So you have to have bought a badge, you have to be a player to get 
on that floor. And then those products or content, the film and television things you might have seen shown at film festivals or television festivals are what is bought and sold um, business to business and then turned around and parlayed to the to the wider public. So there is this symbiotic relationship between the two circuits. So it's possible that a film that does fantastic at Sundance gets picked up by a distributor and is then sold internationally, like a cute little Little Miss Sunshine is bought at Sundance, and then they turn around and sell it to um, Europe mm-hmm. at the European film market. So um, and then the same the same thing can be in reverse. Maybe a product does really well at a market and they choose to use the film festival platform as their promotional marketing to create some audience awareness and create buzz. Yeah. So it happens you, at Sundance every year, all, every year, Toronto Midnight Madness, mm-hmm. you name it. Mm-hmm. So what, one of the things I think that helps put things in perspective is the size and scope of the material presented. So if you look at like a typical Cannes film festival, Mm -hmm. there's like 21 films that are in competition officially. And then right across the promenade is Le Marche du Film, which is the Cannes film market. And there's 3,000, 3,500 films at the market. Mm -hmm. So that shows you the size and scope because what's being sold at the market or shown or screened or viewed is literally the entire year's inventory and a backlog of the year before and what. So it's a good year to three years worth of assets that are competing in this incredible, incredible din of noise to try to make a blip on the radar for anyone to notice you like it, the one of the most humbling experiences ever mm-hmm. is to walk on a market floor with your little one sheet. Oh, man. Yes. Right. Yes. And think my poor baby. And I will tell you, it kicks you in the teeth and says, is your log line strong enough? Is your pitch like you're competing with George Clooney on the market floor looking for money, right? Like right. that's who's there. I mean, you don't normally run into them, but they are there raising money. And so your materials have to be so not just slick and professional, but the concepts and the execution have to be so viscerally grabbing mm-hmm. that someone's willing to risk money on them. And so it really does make you take a step back and check yourself that nobody cares about your hopes and dreams and aspirations. They care about, are you bringing them something they can make money off of? Mm -hmm. Now, can you talk a little bit, well, can you name a few of the big markets that people should look out for? Well, of course, the can, the Le Marche du Film is the can market. The uh, European film market is probably the second largest now. The American film market is the third. And then and then there's there's a ton of others. There's the Hong Kong film art. There's um, uh, the Asian film mark. There's TIFFCOM. Um, then Tana Sur is the Latin American one. But another thing that's kind of bubbled up, which I think is really fascinating and helpful for independent filmmakers, is you have the film markets over here and you have the film or you have the film and TV markets over here and you have film and TV festivals. Oh, and for the just real quickly for TV markets, you have NATP, mm-hmm. which is the National Association of Television Program Executives. You have Real Screen. You have Kids Screen. Again, the Hong Kong film art is both. Mm-hmm. You you have um, the MIPS. We call them the MIPS suites. So there's sure. MIP TV, MIP Doc, MIP Formats. Um, and then you have like uh, NAPP in Europe. There's just a ton. Bogota has one. Mm-hmm. And But in between, you know, you, you've seen, I'm sure, that the independent film arena that was such at the golden era in the 1970s, people are talking about the renaissance that we're seeing and the golden era of television that we're seeing, which is really kind of the shift of independent filmmaking going to television because we have this convergence of film and TV where the what we call over the top television, Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, these, you know, which are almost telcos, right? They're they're almost ISPs that are offering this, you know, this is all the issues of net neutrality, but that that is an opportunity for them to create these that they, to create content and deliver content. So in the middle where the independent filmmaker can often get lost because the studios are doing the huge blockbusters and the networks are doing their channels. 
th- what's bubbling up is this co-production market scene. And that's where things like Cinemart in Rotterdam and the Berlin, Berlin All a co, uh, co-pro market, which is over like while the European film market is going on mm-hmm. and while the Berlin All a film festival is going on, they kind of seamlessly overlap with the Berlinale co-production market, which is where independent producers can find financing, where they can find production partners, where they can find um, distributors well, willing to see projects that are works in progress. And so here's another difference between film festivals and markets. Mm-hmm. People will tell you, um, like, you know, as a screenwriter, never send your script out until it's just kick ass as good as it could possibly be right Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. it okay so with films they tell you never to submit to a festival until it's perfect right because it's being judged Mm -hmm. so a lot of people misperceive that and come over to the market space and say oh i can't show it to them i can't do this because it's a market well they're accustomed to seeing things with holes and placeholders and we're going to do the Mm -hmm. special effects on this and you know they've even done studies where people had missing scenes or animation. They didn't even know that the animation wasn't there because they were so caught up emotionally in the moment. Mm -hmm. So a market they're they're happy to see a talent reel for a possible reality show host or a character that we're going to build a world around in their milieu. They're accustomed to seeing like, let's say you're shooting an independent film and you're not going to be ready by the market, but your opening sequence is awesome. Mm -hmm. You just show that as your sizzle reel or trailer or just some selected scenes. And at the market, their professionals used to seeing products in every stage of development. So that's yet another difference that people, you know, will come with the wrong misperceptions that limit their opportunities. Now, who should attend markets in general? As far as filmmakers are concerned, like, should it be at what level of, of, of the process should they go? Well, I think it depends on what your goals are and what your product is. So you will see on the NAPP floor or, you know, MIPCOM, MIP TV, on the TV markets, people who are not in the industry at all, mm-hmm. who might have a sizzle reel on themselves often or, um, an idea or a concept and they're trying to sell a game show. They're trying to sell a reality show. They're trying to sell some nonfiction thing like Adam ruins everything, you know, some sort of uh, edutainment type product. And even if they, all they have is a one sheet, that's a good one sheet and a good concept. They can literally, you know, buy a badge and go pitch almost door to door. You know, they're Mm -hmm. going sweet to sweet. That's another thing, you know, this, but maybe you're, Listeners don't. Mm -hmm. You look at something like the AFM at the Lowe's Hotel in Santa Monica. They literally move every bed Mm -hmm. out of every room Mm -hmm. and every suite becomes a sales office. So some market floors have booths like a trade show where, you know, you go from booth to booth to booth on a market floor. Nappy has these towers where you go up to the suites and again, they've moved the beds out so you walk in and there's the table and chairs and there could even be cubbies set up with offices for receptionists and all that. Actually, at the Lowe's Hotel, I was one of two people sleeping there during the AFM, mm-hmm. which was you talk about the shining, like <laughs> take a step out into an empty hotel and you're the, not even like there's no room service. There's nobody there. Right, right. It's just closed down. It's it's surreal. So that's I think. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, who goes? So if you're a director, you want to go over to festivals because that's where they're celebrating you. Um, At the markets, it's largely producers. So you might be a writer, producer, director, producer. So if you're wearing a producer hat and you're trying to raise money or you're trying to uh, initiate distribution interest, that's a really good place to be. Another way a lot of producers can use markets that they may not be aware of is not on the first few days, but on the last couple of days, you can go in with your really great one sheet or sizzle reel. And when the distributors are, have gone through the bulk of their meetings, because remember they've paid 30,000 probably to be there. Mm -hmm. So when you show up selling them and they've paid a ton of money to sell, you're in their way. You're in their way. But the last few days, they are thinking about the next market and they're trying to build relationships as well. And the cocktail parties are all great opportunities for this. 
But let's say you come in and you've got your indie film project. You've got a million dollar project and you have a hit list of 10 stars that you think are really good. It's really a good idea to take that simple bulleted list. Don't bore them. Just go in. Here's my one sheet. Here's my log line. These are the 10 stars I'm thinking of. And you might be blown away where they say, um, this person's not marquee value. This person will never get distribution. Uh, I like this person. This person's really good. And someone on that list you might not be aware is really huge in the brick block or the mint, the new mint, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. might be something that you weren't aware was a, a company, uh, a person who would really attract the Chinese market. You know, I'm always trying to think of the other markets or they may say, oh, I like all of these eight uh, mafioso guys, these character actors, and they're all really good. Have you thought about X, Y, Z? And they add some names to your list. And that is priceless information Mm -hmm. because and they may tell you, look, if you get any one of these people off this list, come back to me and we'll talk about a distribution. It may not be a distribution commitment because, you know, it's hard to say, yes, I will distribute your film when it's an unknown commodity. Of course. It's not in the can. So if it's, I mean, that's the thing is your, your film is probably never worth more than when it's nothing yet. <laughs> to a certain extent, you're right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Everyone can imagine in their mind's eye the very best it could possibly be. But a lot of times also, do you, do you agree that depending on the cast, yep. if the cast is big enough, um, there will be commitments to distribute then and there purely because they know if you can afford – Nicholas Cage. Yes, your the the project's going to be at at least a somewhat uh, at a, at a, a benchmark that I know I could sell because you're not going to hire Nicholas Cage and do a twenty thousand dollar movie, right? Well, I will. Yes, I agree, but I will say that there's two parts to that. Sure. Um, one part is that if you get Nicholas Cage, like I got Vanessa Williams, sure, it's not you getting the money. It's It's probably Nicolas Cage or Nicolas Cage's contacts, resources, referrals. So one of the things I suggest people do is make their hit list for who they want as their stars or lead actors and look and see who's got a production company and Mm -hmm. go pitch to the production company of the star you want and let them be partners with you. Because now they're that much more financially incentivized to come on board and be a real partner And then that's when the ball starts rolling. You know, my dad always used to say that the most precious asset in Hollywood is momentum. Mm -hmm. It's momentum, you know, and it's traction, getting people to have it's it's making your enthusiasm contagious so that you can get some traction so that you can create some momentum momentum because you can work for 10 years on a project and blow dust off of it. And if you get the right people to shine their light, man, things happen fast. Oh, you know, that's yeah. the overnight success. So I think that is a huge part of it. And then the other part I will say is a lot of times people make their hit list and their hit, the hit list reveals a lot about you. If you have Tom Cruise and Meryl Streep on your hit list, <laughs> they exactly, they <laughs> may be very polite because they are so polite, yes. but they're laughing at your neophytism, right? Because it's so delusional. But if you come in with some really amazing actors from, say, Breaking Bad or, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. obtainable. Obtainable. Yeah. If you mentioned their name at your family holiday, no one else at the table who's not in the business will know who you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you show them their picture and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that guy. Mm-hmm. But the difference is with a the distributor, they know that the caliber, like David Morse, if you remember, if you know who he is, he was in The Green Mile. He's a fantastic, or Freddie Highmore, oh, yeah. you know, right now in The in the Good Doctor. And he was in Bates Motel. Mm-hmm. So Freddie Highmore at a holiday function the average person not in the business might go i don't know who that is Mm -hmm. well do you watch the good doctor oh yeah yeah i do oh okay that's about or august rush august rush i he deserves a lifetime achievement award already i love him Mm -hmm. but what i would say is that when you come to a distributor with someone like that they may not be you know uh cinema marquee value that he can open a movie by himself no of course not but But what that tells the distributor is the caliber of acting is going to attract other very strong actors. It's going to attract good directors. It's going to attract Mm -hmm. people who 
are going to, that's going to raise the bar of their, of their work. So that, so if you came with a few, it's like in the old days, you needed your Sylvester Stallone Mm -hmm. or Van Damme to sell DVs in Asia. Sure. Right. But it's changing. It's changing a lot. So now the mass, you know, of YouTube competition, it's quality that rises up. And so having a good concept, well-written, well-executed with really good stars, I think our star culture, while it's still hugely important, you look at any advertisement, it's all about celebrity, but it's changing because of the fragmentation of the dial and what the Internet has done to revolutionize our business. So you mean Steven Seagal versus Mike Tyson is going to have problems? <laughs> <laughs> Not if they're fighting. <laughs> that was the that was the most AFME AFM movie of this yeah. year. Do you remember when it was a couple Emmys ago where they put all the YouTube stars on the red carpet? No, I didn't. Okay, this so was a couple Emmys ago, and they took all these uh, YouTube stars with millions of followers, and they thought, "Oh, we're going to tap into their zeitgeist." And what you realize is asking questions on a red carpet is a skill set that Ryan Seacrest and the people who've earned the Mm -hmm. right to be there, like they didn't know who they were talking to. They were disrespectful and they thought that their 15 minutes of fame was going to carry them on red carpet. And people forget this is a business. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think it's fine to stunt cast maybe one YouTube celeb. And if you are a YouTube celeb, then then cool, that's you. But make sure you populate that cast with rock solid actors around you, because everyone in the business can see through a fame run. And it's getting and it's getting wow. like before it was all about how many followers you have. And I yep. think to a certain extent, a lot of uh, casting decisions now are made on social media. Uh, if if the if there's two actors of e- of equal caliber. Um, equal credits. That's assuming they're equal caliber and equal credit. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's not usually that case. Usually yeah. not. But if you assume that they're, you know, at the same playing field, yeah, they're going to go with the one that has the bigger social follower. Absolutely. But they also have ways of assessing your uh, digital footprint. Like I have a um, a widget in mind when I look on Twitter. I know how many of your followers are fake. Mm-hmm. I know how many you bought. Mm-hmm. That's and that's. What- that wasn't that, around before. Yeah. And and a huge thing is your engagement. Like, are mm-hmm. you perceived to be authentic in your engagement with a legit tribe? Right. You know, we have our, our mutual friend, Richard Botto, the Our founder band. of Stage 32. Sure. His crowdsourcing for filmmakers book is all about that. Like, mm-hmm. it's being authentic to a community. So I think it's really important that people like it's really important to have a social media following and a social media presence and be authentic but it's like anything else like you know it's the quality of how you do it you can't just buy a million followers and slap up promotional stuff because first of all those million followers probably aren't even real and don't care so they're not going to leave in droves but the real people are if all you ever do is throw up you know jpegs of your book that you're selling right a perfect example i always use is there was this filmmaker that i was working with on a project years ago and they spent i'm gonna say they spent like about four or five thousand dollars buying views yeah. yep. of their trailer yeah um and nothing and we all know it now. right so but they thought that like they, and i think they got i think it got up to about a million and a half two million views that they spent money all spent yeah like nothing organic no interaction, no yep. anything. But yeah. they were touting that to distributors like, look, we've gotten 2 million hits on our trailer. Give us money for our movie. There's an audience yeah. out there for it. Yeah. And that might have worked in 1995. Exactly. <laughs> but not today. And well, people can definitely yeah. tell when it's – look, it's not hard to find out if you're if they're fake or not. You exactly. just have to look at the engagement. And yep. even the engagement they're trying to fake now. And you yeah. see, it's still so difficult to fake real engagement. Yeah, I know someone, a very high profile author, producer, TV person. So I, I am, and they've passed away and they were very beloved. So I won't throw them under the bus because that would be disrespectful. Sure. But they hired friends of mine to go online into the chat rooms and take on, t- this was way back in the day. So it is not new. Well, you said chat take rooms. On, so you yeah, said chat rooms. Take so on, yeah take on personas so they would have three, four, five different personas each and get into debates and arguments with themselves. 
Right. Like, and be trolls and jerks and, you know, so that other people would jump in and then they'd get out of that chat room and go start somewhere else so that pe- there, there was buzz and engagement. But I think that, um, you know, first of all, people are really savvy to that now. And then the flip side of that is too bad because the person who really busts their tail to get a million or two million followers legitimately and then goes to bandy that about the marketplace Now everybody's pretty jaded. And even if you earned them and spent 15 Mm -hmm. years creating that following, they're like, yeah, yeah. But that that comes back to the quality of the content and the material, you know. And also and also and I know we're going on a tangent with social media, but it's important in in regards to what we're doing is also the 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 proof is in the pudding. You know, like, uh, you know, I'll I'll (laughs) tell you right really quickly if you're real or not purely by I'm like, do a post. Yeah. Do a post and it, we'll see how many retweets they get or how many yeah. reactions they get and see how much traffic I can generate off of it. If right. it's something that's tr- hitting too much, I'll tell you in a second, like, here you go. Boom. And, yeah. uh, you know, so when people find people who are actually real and authentic, yeah. they gravitate to they those people. To it. Absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you something beyond the social media is also your assets, your marketing assets. So I help people create pitch packages, mm-hmm. sizzle reels, practice their pitch and all that. And I've been a judge at, you know, Nat P's player, TV player, contest, bunch Pitch of, fest, bunch of right. different things. Yeah, forever. So one of them at one market, and again, I don't want to, you know, hurt anyone's reputation. I'll just share the spirit of the story. Mm-hmm. This gal came in and she was competing. And she, um, the first round, I think there were three rounds. And the first round was to pitch verbally. And so this girl came in and pitched her heart out on, I think it was a mafia comedy, like a sitcom. She was so hysterical. We were like wiping tears. Well, I think there were eight or 12, I don't know, several judges. I don't remember how many judges, about eight, let's say. But we were laughing, literally slapping our knees, wiping away tears, cracking up. She had us eating out of her hand and we loved her. We loved her project. We loved everything about her. So then she made it to the second round. And in the second round, she brought in her sizzle reel. And in her sizzle, she had spent $250,000. No. And she had, I don't know if it was friends or I don't know who these actors were, but in this sizzle, uh, oh. the, produ- the production value was awful. The timing was awful. The acting was awful. The costumes were awful. And two hundred and fifty thousand. And that is not the only time I've seen that. I've seen people do better with zero budget than two hundred fifty. I've seen lots of bad. How I'm just figuring out how do you spend a quarter of a million dollars on a sizzle reel? Like how do you do it? It happens all the time. Oh my god! So because companies want to get paid and they, I think, prey on uh, delusions. So. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, and I'm proud of myself, I'm not bragging, but just it's hard to find people who will tell the truth in Hollywood. And I do always and get in trouble all the time. So I will take credit when it helps. (laughs) So she was going to get knocked out. And I spoke up in the the voting round with her in the room Uh and said, I got to tell you, I said, I'm going to point out the elephant in the room because everybody was giving her feedback on the sizzle reel. Yeah. And I said to her. To and to the fellow judges, I said, "Look, that sizzle reel. Unfortunately, you have wasted two hundred fifty thousand dollars." You know, and her face had fa- she was almost in tears. You know, she the- should be. Yeah. She was almost in tears because everybody was ripping the sizzle reel to sh- shreds, and she was going to get knocked out of the contest, and she'd spent all this money. And I said, "Look, I said I'm going to vote to put you through, on the caveat that you pitch verbally again." Because you had us, you had us imagining your vision and this sizzle reel is going to kill you. So you need to never show it (laughs) to anyone again, ever. I don't care how much it cost. I don't care how much blood and tears went into it. It's going to shoot you in the foot. It's an albatross to your project. Let it go. Consider it a mistake. And, and, and she, everybody changed their votes and we put her through and she pitched verbally and she did, she didn't win, but she was like number two or number three. And she was really grateful. And I, I mean, it's heartbreaking to tell someone that, but it's true. Oh, you've got to, you've got to tell them the truth. And it's not even up for debate. It was just like, look, 
this was horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> and you're hurting yourself by, by but showing also this. To acknowledge how fantastic she did without even a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. And it, that that shows the integrity of the idea, her passion, her personality, her ownership and authenticity with that material. As the writer, she had earned the right to stand up and bowl us over. And it was so well executed on the page. It is not her fault that the collaborators didn't rise to the occasion and she can find other collaborators because she owns the intellectual property. It's her baby. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, how um, how should someone with a digital series approach a television market in today's world? Because now, as you said, everything's going towards television. Um, yeah. What, how should someone – should they do a pilot? Should they just come in with the idea? Should they do have a full series produced? What do you, what's your suggestion? Well, I think all of those. Okay. You know, It's like Hollywood. How do you break into Hollywood? Well, let's give you the 2,000 ways we all know friends who've done it. You know, it, there, There's no right or wrong. I will say there are probably some quicker avenues than others. And then the minute you say this is the way you do it, then there's some breakout Blair Witch success that, you know, it's just stuff that happens. um, Angry Orange. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I mean, I there's a ton of examples of Mm -hmm. stuff. But one way they do watch, just as we were talking about earlier with social engagement, uh, there are people who put up um, Twitter accounts that are in the voice or the point of view of one of their characters and then voice. Mm -hmm. And that's. I think how eight things um, about my daughter, eight rules about my daughter got done was started off a Twitter feed. You know, it was that such a unique, authentic voice. So um, coming up with ways to so like uh, I think it was Angry Orange was a little two minute thing that was an orange, literally an orange that had like mm-hmm. Marky face drawn on it. Yes, and yes. It he's, done ridiculous. Very, he's done very well. Yeah. So they were like 30 second, two minute things, but they were so freaking funny. They went viral. And you know, I forget who it was, a uh, pretty famous gal. I should remember her name, but she said, viral is not a business plan. <laughs> like Sundance is not a distribution plan. Exactly. Winning Sundance is not a distribution plan. You cannot, that's like saying, <laughs> I'm going to buy a lottery ticket. Yes, somebody <laughs> who my... wins, somebody who buys a ticket will win. But your odds, like that's not the business plan. Go ahead, throw the penny in the fountain. I'm going to quit, my, all, I'm gonna yeah, quit my, I'm quitting my job today because exactly. my, my next year, I'm covered because I'm going to do the scratch off. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I throw pennies and fountains and I'm all about superstitious little rituals. Cool. Do it. Buy your lottery tickets. I all the more power to you. Sure. But and call me if you win. Please, please call. Because I have five projects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So but some of the things they can do one, of course, if you're like I judged the Marseille Web Fest uh, several years back. Mm-hmm. And that was fascinating because, you know, Josh Gad. Yeah, of course. OK, yeah, the, Josh um, Gad won. Olaf. Olaf. right? Yeah. Yeah, he was Olaf in Beauty and the Beast, but he also had uh, 1600 Pen, if you remember that. It was a short-lived series. Mm-hmm. So right before – with Dharma, the girl who played Dharma and Dharma and mm-hmm. Greg. Mm-hmm. Right before that, um, he was submitted into the uh, Marseille Web Fest. And it was me and I think the Warner Brothers digital VP, a bunch of really cool people. So we were you know, sequestered in a room for 12 hours watching nothing but websites, one af- uh, web series, one after another. And there were people who had fantastic business plans and ancillary marketing and merchandising. And it was so well, like sales and marketing 101, like, or not even that PhDs in sales and marketing, but we weren't engaged by their content. Mm -hmm. So what difference did it make? Right. And then you had people who had years of seasons and seasons, like hundreds of episodes. And then you had Josh Gad with like two little three minute sketches that were practically SNL. And again, we're in hysterics. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes down to the quality. So if you have, let's say you have a web series that's won some awards, don't expect someone to watch eight episodes of it. Grab the, you know, 30 seconds or two minutes of the very, very, very best footage And don't feel like it needs to be five minutes or seven minutes or any of that. If it's if you have a really good two minutes, that's a beginning, middle and end. And there's a little bit of weak stuff. Mm -hmm. When in doubt, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out. If Mm -hmm. it is not very, very, very best cream of the crop. You know, they say Shakespeare threw away 95 percent of his stuff. I don't know how anyone knows that. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I believe it as a writer. Sure. And I would love to be in that trash can. Exactly. (laughs) But that's what I'm saying. You got to throw away, kill your babies, kill your darlings, and then only take the cream of the crop. And then that tease, you know, you sell the sizzle, not the steak. 
Yep. You want to elicit their interest and in- intrigue them to want more, and you may not show them more. Mm-hmm. You may get into a room, they're really engaged, they have their different ideas, and you go in their direction because he who has the gold wins. Mm-hmm. Don't feel like you owe it to the material to bring in your old crap that they might not – What find what tickled them because it might be different. Like what Spike TV is interested in is going to be quite different than what the Sci-Fi Channel is interested in. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. And then, and that's a, a problem for a lot of creators is that they yeah. spend so much time, so much money creating something. They want to show it all. Exactly. But it's – and and you just Like don't. baby pictures. Pick right. Up. It's your baby. You want to show baby <laughs> pictures to everybody. I try not to do that, but uh, but right. I do it every once in a while. That's what uh, Pinterest is for. <laughs> you, you know, uh, exactly. But at the end of the day, you've got to take off your creator hat and put on your business hat, put on your marketing yeah. hat and go, okay – what I got to look at this with clean eyes. And if yeah. you can't have someone who can do it for you and ditto your YouTube channel, maybe you have a YouTube channel that's got all of that on there, but you have a branded YouTube channel that only has the best of the best that represents the show, which is, you know, you think of what you put on social media, especially what you're putting on that is projecting to the industry is your 24 seven shingle. Mm -hmm. Don't put crap out there. And if you do, like hide it in a way that only friends and family can see it. But if you're going to put it out there on your website, anywhere, you know, it's way better to have three great two minute clips than something that's, you know, really two hours of bad. (laughs) That's what they say. The greatest sin in Hollywood is to be boring. Yes. And there has been plenty of that going on at the the movie theaters lately. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you know? And and on the market floors and at the festivals and co-production markets, you know, I, I used to joke that, you know, the perfume of Hollywood is desperation. Oh, God, that's a great line. And it's so true. Oh, yeah. And you so, and 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 because I used to wear that uh, that oh, we've to, all worn it. We've oh, all to desperation. It. Yeah, and the pers- and the deodorant, like it, it comes out. It's the bo of Hollywood is desperation. Also, <laughs> I mean, it is something that you can smell on someone. Yeah, so you can fast smell it coming into the room, into a ballroom, you can smell. It. And I and I used to, I used to just, just it would, it would spring, just surround me. <laughs> I used to spring out of me like uh, what's his name from uh, Charlie Brown, the guy who's always yeah. dirty, Chef Rock. Uh, yeah, he, he would just <laughs> always walk. Over his head. Yeah. yeah, it was around me all the time. Yeah, and I would meet someone when I first got here. I would meet someone, you know, at another level, a higher level, or or just a place yeah. where, that I could. And I'd be like, "Hi, how you doing?" And then you would just go after them. Yeah, and, and they could just be like, oh, "Okay, he's that," and that would be the end of it. Yeah, uh, and it happened to me a bunch of times till I finally, I don't know how I did it, but naturally I just stopped it yeah. and became more giving and more of service to people I meet, trying to be. Well- and that I think is the, is the, to me, networking is the highest form of service. It's what do they need? How can I help them? And you hope that by the time it pays forward 10 times somewhere, it comes around back to you. Right. But, you know, when you're trying to intentionally network, you know, one of the most prudent things is to ask them about them and their projects because, and that's the thing you have to be careful of with you is because when someone asks a writer about their project, oh no, right? We love our babies. We want to talk about them. That's all we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So you really are. It's kind of like being on a first blind date after a divorce. You don't really want to talk about your ex, right? right? Mm -hmm. So you want to listen and ask questions. And if the conversation comes back around to you, be locked and loaded with a silver bullet. That's really quick and easy and kills. Right. But don't, don't, but don't walk up with that bullet in hand just yet. Don't shoot it off. Z or the you know, the machine gun. Like, yeah. Oh God! Have one silver bullet. I yeah. it's 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 just so funny. And I meet and I, I was my next question was going to be about networking. Um, and I think we're on that topic now. But like sometimes I'll be speaking and you know people will come up and they'll just they just kind of like you can tell that they're they're just wanting to they're I call even them energy suckers. Even successful people. Right, you know, yeah. just just energy suckers. They just yeah. like want to suck vampires. From, yeah, vampires. They just want to suck yeah. from you. And you know, you as you get older and you've been in the business long enough, you become attuned to that uh, mm-hmm. that frequency very quickly. Your your hair goes on end as they come up, as they approach. Oh, and you can smell it. You can yeah, smell. it's the O to desperation. <laughs> There's the O to desperation. There's the O of 
BS. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> like, totally. I've, you know, I'm not trying to do anything, but I'm just trying to impress you because I've done this, this, and this. I know this. Yeah. And I could definitely get your project to this person because cu- I cut their hair. <laughs> I'll tell you two, two quick little stories about that. I was, um, I, I, you know, I'm not a vain person. You know, we, we all get beat up so much. I guess you just don't have time or energy to be vain. You <laughs> just got to keep working this, hard. Not on this side of the camera, at least. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at an event. It was a women's event and I was talking to a group of women and, you know, I'm a, I'm a first, I'm a, I was a first time director. I think I've done two things now, but you know, I'm really still a rookie. I really am trying to break in as a director. So I was at this event and I have done, I had directed a million dollar feature, which on the one hand, anyone in the business knows like soup to nuts. That is, that's like an ultra marathon series like mm-hmm. that. It's a huge accomplishment, whether it made any money or not, it mm-hmm. got in the can mm-hmm. and it got picked up by two distributors. It was at the AFM huge and, the, and huge camp. success, huge success, right? Huge. It was at Walmart, Best Buy. Okay. Oh. So who really cares if it was any good or made any money like that? Just the fact that we got from point A to point Z and I did not die or kill anybody. Right. Right. So I, and it had Meatloaf and Ed Asner and Eddie Furlong. So I'm at this event and I'm feeling like simultaneously proud and scared shitless and insecure and blah, blah, blah. And these girls are talking about all the stuff they've directed and they're posing and dropping names and being all, all this. So I'm just sitting listening because I really need to network and I really need to learn a lot more and I need to expand my horizons, blah, 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 blah. Well, like an hour of listening to them give all sorts of advice and tell me what I should do. It comes around that one of them's entire directing oeuvre was a PSA. <laughs> okay. And the other one had done a short film. So oh. I sat there and, and not that I'm all that, but I sat there respectfully listening to all. And, and then when they asked me what I had done, which like the event was almost over. And I was like, oh, you know, just a million dollar feature with meatloaf and Ed Ad- and then I walked away because they like seriously could <laughs> care less. Like, like I sat there, they, they had done a free public service announcement for 30 seconds. And sure. that was what they directed. Sure. And the flip side of that, I was going to say is when people are posing, you know, the, if you have to get a catcher's mitt out to catch the names that they drop, oh. Odds are they're full of it. And if you call them out on it, oh, I have two stories. I had a guy who told me, and I won't say who he is because he's kind of a power player, Mm -hmm. but he told me he, well, it'll be too obvious. He had directed a little movie called, and then I won't put the movie in, but it was a huge movie. Sure. You know, he had, he had line produced a little movie called insert huge movie here. Sure. And I was like, oh my God, I better check my ego. And so I sucked it up Uh. and let him treat me like shit because he was a misogynist and he was awful. And then I optioned my material to him, which was a huge mistake. And then I Googled because nowadays you can IMDB while you're in the bathroom. Like now I've learned, like, excuse me, go to the bathroom, IMDB the shit out of their lies, right? But it turned out he had second unit line. Oh, no, he had told me he had produced it, but he had second unit line produced it. Which is, he's basically, yeah. 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 Producer is like finding the money, soup to nutting it. And second unit line producing is someone who was hired to cut checks for a couple of days. Second, not even the main line producer, the second unit producer. Second unit line producer when he told me he had produced it. But then the third I was going to say, because it goes the other way too, is people who drive the flashy cars and have the Mm -hmm. gorgeous homes can sometimes be so... um, so encumbered and so leased and so fake about what they're projecting as their image Mm -hmm. that they don't have the money to scrape together change out of their dash for a iced tea at a McDonald's. Right. Yep. 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 And sometimes you'll be with someone who's driving a beat up car and they're not in expensive shoes and they do not offer to pick up the tab that's on somebody else's expense account. And they are the person who owns 21 homes free and clear and could actually fund your film, but they're not trying to impress you and they are cheap. And the reason they're rich is because they're cheap. <laughs> and that doesn't mean they won't invest in your film. So, I mean, it goes both ways. I, I do find, and, and this is, again, only from uh, ex- years of experience, that the people who are the big loudmouths, the people yeah. who are the boasters, yes, there are those guys, you know, there are the Brett Ratners of the world that are those kind of people, you know, and do <laughs> actually know these people and, and actually have the money and stuff. And I threw Brett out there because uh, he deserves to be thrown out there. Um, <laughs> uh, and I have no problem with that. Um, but there, but most of the times you're going to 
you know, if you see the guy quiet in the room and he's in the room, first of all, or she's in the mm-hmm. room, that means that they've done something to be in that room. Yeah. And generally speaking, they're not going to be the boasting guys. They're not going to be the ones dropping names. If you see yeah. Steven Soderbergh's car, mm-hmm. he drives like a 2005 or 2008 right. Prius. I think Warren Buffett does too, by the way. Right. Exactly. Because yeah. they, they're not trying to impress anyone. They're, they're dealers. Not, and they're not, yeah. And they're, very, and they're rare in L.A. They're yeah. rare in, in the business in general. You don't meet those people very well, often. Well, to be fair, they're rare on Wall Street. They're yeah, rare in th- Nashville. Absolutely. Yeah. No, they're rare everywhere. In they're every, rare in every, Vegas. <laughs> they're rare in every industry. Yeah. But in our business, you know, you don't meet those people. So when I do actually meet people like RB, uh, like yeah. a, a Suzanne Lyons, who's a good friend like of ours. Like you. Yeah. <laughs> like you as well. Um, people, you know, people who are actually doing what they're saying they're doing and are not yeah. boasting about Hey, I've got, you know, 300,000 followers and right. I, you know, I have this or I have that. The proof's in the pudding. Yeah. I'm like, look, you just, you know, go and look, you know, look me up. I don't care. Yeah. You know, look, or they'll say, look, you know, I, I don't and, want to talk about it. And that quite frankly is the value to your website and social media. You know, the more I feel like, and my website's not perfect, but I try really hard to have it project a good image. But I think that's good because you can have a conversation, give them a business card, and then they can do their due diligence on you and they can check you out after the fact. They can check your bio. They can check your credits on IMDb. And so you can just be a human being involved and engaged in the conversation and not be trying to spit out your resume. So, you know, that is that's how I think you can be using your marketing and social media and, and those things to 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 back you up with this 24th shingle that's out there all the time but just be a human being when you, and be present in those conversations now we've gone off off the rails a little bit in this interview because uh, we were talking more about markets but this all works into the networking it's all it different. all works in yeah. um yeah. but can you add, can you throw a few insider nuggets of things that we should look for at film markets things that you like i wish i would have known this doing a market <laughs> Before. Well, there's so much that I wrote a book on it. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> tell you, like well, that's the whole. That's actually the whole reason for the book was because yeah. you said you had uh, gone to one of your first markets recently. Yeah, yeah, FM, yeah. Really, kind of like blown away and overwhelmed. I, I think anyone in this business should just get on a market floor as fast as possible because mm-hmm. you, what you learn yeah. and how humbling it is. Uh, will really put things in perspective for the rest of your career. So it's whether a, you sell anything, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, it's a product, and that was the thing I said in in my review of AFM. Like, it's so humbling because they don't yeah. care about the craft, they don't yeah. care about the artistry, they don't care about. It's a product, and it, yeah. And as soon as you understand that, that yeah. changes your perspective a whole. I don't care oh, about your personal right. project. They don't care about it. Yeah, you know? and they're not being mean either. No, they're it's business. Just, it's not even callous. They're just so matter of fact. Mm-hmm. And they can smile while they're, they're just eviscerating you. Absolutely. Oh, painful. Absolutely they can. Because, <laughs> you know, it's art to us. But they don't care. They don't care. Obviously, Steven Seagal and Mike Tyson, not a lot of art in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> so so I will say that, honestly, like, I, I'll tell you, how, like, how the book started. And then I'll tell you a couple secrets. Um I was at the American film market in 2013. I booked all the speakers and I was helping focal press come up with their, uh, line, their franchise line, the AFM presents. Sure. And so they had focal press had said, you know, who do you think would make a good, uh, author for one of our books or in our series and who would be a good subject matter expert. And I was like, you know, you need to get RB to do something on crowdsourcing Mm -hmm. I had got him on a panel. I was like, you've got to get no, nobody's talking about that. And I gave him all these names of people. And I'd gotten um, another friend, Anne-Marie Gillen, on the finance panel. I just really tried hard to get, you know, some new fresh voices that we needed to be hearing at the AFM. I was actually really proud because people told me later they opened up the full page spread in I was Hollywood Reporter, Daily Variety, and it had all the pictures mm-hmm. for the all the panelists. And people, at least a dozen people wrote me privately and said, I don't know how you did it, but it was 50-50 female male, Mm -hmm. and it was every color of skin under the sun. Because normally we don't see that. So I really had like my own private agenda to try to really Mm -hmm. diversify what we saw so that you weren't ghettoizing, like putting all the women on one panel because we don't need to, you know, and you can avoid that panel or all the people of color on one panel and that's our diversity panel, but get one on every <laughs> right. panel. That was my but goal. Good. Anyway. Um, so 
she, so when I was helping her, I was giving her all these people that I, I think I got eight or a dozen friends book deals that year. Mm-hmm. Um, she said, well, if you come up with anything else, let us know. And I said, I can tell you right now what you're missing. And she said, what? I go, you've got the American Film Market Presents and no one's ever written a book on how to work the markets. Mm-hmm. And her face just dropped like, yeah, duh. It's like always the obvious that we miss. Mm-hmm. And so I said, I'll, I'll write it, you know, and I, of course, didn't feel like I was a guru. I just knew I could research and I reached out to at least 200 people. I did interviews for a couple of years for that mm-hmm. book. Mm-hmm. So some of the things I learned at one of at one AFM, I was sitting there and I won't mention names of companies. Mm-hmm. Although I will tell you privately. <laughs> sure. No problem. I appreciate it. Um, anyway, I was sitting there with a girlfriend and we were going in to meet someone I had interviewed. Cause that was another thing I did. I used it to network like crazy. So then I could meet 200 people that were, you know, international sales agents and distributors and all that financiers and investors. So I was sitting there to meet one of the people who I'd interviewed with. And we were on the other side of this cubby wall because, you know, they sometimes have these temporary cubby walls and like there's four feet of empty root, you know, that it's the wall is not there. So on the other side was somebody pitching and on the other side of another wall were a couple of people. So there was an established distributor who was teaching a wet behind the ears rookie distributor who was new to their company of how to do what they needed to do. And I don't know how much you know about like I, I do my own budgets and schedules and I can mm-hmm. line produce and stuff. So I don't know how much you know about this, but it mm-hmm. hit us. But basically, when you do an independent film, you have to often do a SAG bond, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say you have a million dollar film and your budget for your actors is, let's say, Mm 200,000. So SAG might make you put up 200,000 or 50,000, but you have to put up a bond Mm -hmm. so that if for any reason you flake out and don't pay the payroll for that week, SAG can dip into this bond that it's a formula that they make you that they hold the whole time. So mm-hmm. if you need a million dollars, you actually need a 1.2 million because you got to put this money up that sits there that you can't touch until you get it back. And so this distributor was explaining to the other distributor, the new distributor, how they could basically make a commission hmm. off <laughs> you getting your SAG bond refunded to you. If they use the wording for gross receipts into the account they were managing. Okay. So in other words, they're supposed to be selling your film and getting a commission from Turkey or China or, you know, wherever they're selling it. And as those monies come in, they take 10%, 20%, whatever their commission is off the top. Sure, sure. So she was teaching him how to get the bond, the savings account you raised, blood, sweat, and tears that you had sitting there to pay your actors that when you got it back from SAG, they could take ten to twenty percent of it because it passed through their account. So let me so let me clarify something. You're telling me that they're unscrupulous uh, dirt distributors uh, in the marketplace. Can you imagine? Is this is this an exclusive? And they were <laughs> training one another down the daisy chain how to screw independent producers. So no. I know that's shocking. It's absolute. I've never but heard of anything like think this. About that. Like, you're going to take a commission off my savings account that I barely scraped together to make this film? Is this and Wall Street? What is this? Oh, my God. And then they want us to sign a contract that says, oh, yeah, yeah, you can handle my money. I trust you. Yes, yes. So those are the kinds of things. So literally during the course of writing this book, I will say I – and this is probably not politically correct, but we've established I'm an idiot. Yes. Um, I <laughs> – Probably will make very little money off this, you know, because the publisher makes 80%. You think oh, no, the speakers are bad. Okay, so I, I don't know. People are like, oh, I'll buy your book. I'm like, thanks. Like, when I, like, maybe I'll see two cents 10 years from now. I don't know. So I was so frustrated writing this book because of all that I was learning and all of that. And then I didn't even want to do it. It was two years of work for free. For what? Right? I know. I know. But yeah. what kept me going was storytellers yeah. around the world content creators, people who have a dream, people who have a passion, people who have a story that is so under their skin that they're working for two or five or 10 years for free speculatively. And I thought I got to help them. I got to help them navigate these markets. I got to help them stop being screwed. I got to help them save money. And and I will tell you, this is really inappropriate. And I I love it. I love it. We must need to edit it. No, we won't. (laughs) I was in the AFM series originally in the franchise. Sure. Sure. And and I was part of that. And it was always going to be that. And it was kicked out 
because um, of many of the things I said of how to save money and how to, you know, okay, if you can't afford a badge, here's what you do. <laughs> you know? I mean, well, I mean, Heather, to, Heather, to, Heather, Heather, to, <laughs> to, uh, to AFM's uh, defense here, I'm sorry, but I get that. <laughs> I get it too. And I edited it all out. You know what I mean? But the but damage was, still, was done. The damage was done. And so the truth is, you know, there's a lot in this book that the markets don't want you to know. And the other thing was, by the end of it, I was like, okay, here's how you work around the markets. Here's how you take everything you've learned yeah. that will work on a market floor. And here's how you DIY it. Here's how you do YouTube. Here's how you use social media. Here's how you sell, not business to business, but business to consumer, because sure. that is the revolution that Amazon and who, well, they're still in the middle. You literally could have your own website and sell your books and your movies and your TV if they're good enough directly to the crowd that you're creating. Mm -hmm. So I think it was too independent and too, too irreverent, real, too, real. too real. And I have a problem with that. No, so. I, look, I, 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 I give away uh, – yeah. I give away um, – uh, a lead generator for if you sign up to my email list, uh, six six tips to get into film festivals for free or cheap. Yeah, exactly. And I I, hate I, to hear it. Yeah. I got into uh, over six hundred film festivals in the course of my career, and I paid for probably less than five percent or ten percent of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, sometimes that rubs film uh, film festivals the wrong way. I'm like, but guys, look, you know, <laughs> this is well, just the way it is. It's such a hard business. You know, people are like, I would volunteer for variety summits. I vol I volunteered for everything I couldn't afford to go to, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm a little peon peasant with a name badge, but I get to hear the studio execs telling it like it is to, a, you know, be a fly on the wall to the $5,000 a seat thing I can't get into. So you just, you, we, one thing about independent filmmakers is we are scrappy. We are resilient. And we are pit bulls, and we need to learn to be unflappable badasses. <laughs> now, can you say that? Uh, can you talk? Uh, we, you spoke about the book a bit, but what's the name of the book, and where can they get it? Um, it's called How to Work the Film and TV Markets, and it's available on Amazon. It's available, you know, it's actually at a lot of the markets. the The publisher took it to the AFM, and it sold out in the first day. I'm sure. So. Yeah. Sure. So m my website is heatherhale.com and I will put a plug because uh, it's not even cost okay. them any money, but on heatherhale.com, I'm pretty sure it's forward slash how to work the film and TV markets, um, is all sorts of giveaway stuff. Like it has a calendar of the ma of the markets all around the world, mm -hmm. co-production markets, festivals. And I'll tell you that, that calendar, that matrix took me forever because I had to line up what was going on simultaneously. What was an adjunct event? What was going on? Like if you're going to another country, what could you also hit while you're there? It's mm -hmm. a really great calendar. I've got the, um, the facts on packs. So who's got housekeeping deals where I've got them archived. So you can look back who used to have a deal with what studio and what distributor, it's got um, so many different sets of information. So, and that's all, you know, it's got a global map. It's got all the market statistics. It's got some great full color um, key art examples. Mm -hmm. It's got a union's low budget matrix. Cause if you can ever make sense of that game of Sudoku, good luck. <laughs> right. So it's got, anyway, it's heatherhale.com, how to work the film and TV markets. And it's got tons of giveaways and then, um, and then also on there, there's a 21% off on Amazon and 20% off the publishers, like a code. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's going to make my two cents go to one, but, you know, <laughs> that. I, love, I love the honesty. It's <laughs> awesome. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes for everybody. Awesome. So you. I have a few questions left uh, that I ask yes, all my sir. guests, uh, all my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker or screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Oh, can we have another hour? No. <laughs> uh, um, honestly, this is going to sound really cliche and soapy, and but it's so true. It's just so freaking true. And you rem you get reminded of it every year and every decade. And that's just be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Be true to yourself. Be authentic and know who your friends are because you will learn over and over and over again who they are and who they aren't. And you know, if you're going to be miserable working around the clock at two in the morning, you damn well better make sure it's something worth working on. Mm -hmm. And I, and I would say also, you know, 
when we create film and television products or content, I mean, a lot of people, artists hate to hear it referred to as product and content, but at the marketplace, that is what it is. It's a art over at the festivals, but whatever it is that you're creating, that you're generating, you are essentially exporting our culture. Mm -hmm. So I would beseech you to please be careful that you're really espousing values you actually hold, not lowering to pander to the lowest common denominator of what you think you can sell because you could have a breakout hit with something that's actually meaningful. You know, you look at Shawshank Redemption and Groundhog Day and, you know, there are films out there and it's nothing wrong with entertainment, like cult hits, like there's so much good stuff out there, but, um, you know, do stuff you're really proud of and that really means something to you. And it's cool if it's comedy, thriller, horror, whatever it is. But I mean, even look at alien aliens, those are real horror, like in um, yes. Silence of the Lamb and The Believers. Like there's some scary shit out there and it's still entertaining. So I'm not saying it has to be G-rated Disney. Sure, anime. sure, sure, sure. I'm just saying make sure that what you're saying with your art is really what you mean because it's easy for it to get, you know, going through that gauntlet mm -hmm. to get like GMO two-headed shaped weird. <laughs> it's not what you meant at all. Right. So, you know, stay true to yourself, stay true to your voice. And, and one thing that is good about Hollywood, well, there are many, 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 many good things about Hollywood. But one of the things I love most about it is it is a society and a culture where everywhere you look, people are following their dreams mm -hmm. everywhere. And it is exciting. It's entrepreneurs, I call them. Everywhere you look is people who passionately believe, usually, and they're scams and posers and flakes and phonies and all that. Mm -hmm. But most of the heart that beats in Hollywood is people who have a mission for something they want to say that's so under their skin that they're trying to figure out a way to say it and hold true to that. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like I always say, you know, um, I'm a I'm a voluptuous girl, so I'm lucky because I'm very thick skinned because you need a rhinoceros skin Oof. to survive in Hollywood. But one of the hardest things is to keep your heart open mm -hmm. and to stay um, responsive to the communal consciousness and to have empathy for other people's worldviews and points of views. So if you can don't be a dick. <laughs> That's uh, a, that should be on a T-shirt. If don't it's be not, a dick. don't be a dick. That's like the best advice you can yeah. have in Hollywood. Don't, don't be, be a dick. Just don't be a dick. <laughs> yeah. Be a nice person. And that doesn't mean be a doormat. It means right. be an unflappable badass who right. can cheerfully tell the truth and be honest and be, you know, have good intentions and, and, and write great stories because the world needs them. Amen. More now than ever. Um, yeah. Can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Oh, boy, this is going to reveal my libertarian roots. Um, <laughs> and probably Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead. Those oh, were wow. Okay. Really. Um, I, I know that's not an industry book, but sure. you know, it's all about Gulch Gulch. <laughs> Yeah, I got you. I got you. I got you. No problem. No problem. Um, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Oh, my goodness. There's so many. And I'm not sure I've learned them all. Uh -huh. um, okay, well, I'm stealing this from my dad, but I think he would allow me to. And I'll probably cry because he recently passed. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't have to make every mistake personally. Interesting. And that you can surround yourself with mentors and mastermind groups and friends, and you can learn from other people's mistakes and advice. And that doesn't yes. mean, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have to make every mistake yourself. If you're smart, you can learn from others' mistakes. And yeah. try, and because, I mean, if, why wouldn't you? Sometimes, right. sometimes you have to learn it by sticking your hand in the fire. But if yeah. enough people tell you, hey, I've been burned there. Don't put your hand there. And that's why you have to know who your friends are. Yes. Because there are a lot of people who are going to tell you, oh, don't put your hand in my cookie jar when really you can build your own cookie jar and they shouldn't be in your kitchen. Right? <laughs> yes. You need to know who your friends are because your friends, and I am very blessed to have a few who will tell you when you're being a shit who will tell you when you're being myopic, who will tell you when you're not seeing the forest for the trees. 
And and then there's times where, and I've had this happen many, many, many times where, you know, you have an email and you send it to a few friends to make sure that they vet it, to make sure it's not too emotional or you're not saying anything that could be slanderous or whatever. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can have, every, and I had this happen, as a matter of fact, uh, it's an old story I've told many times, but I wrote to Sherry Lansing once. Mm-hmm. And everybody in my circle said, no, don't send it, don't send it, don't send it. No, you'll embarrass yourself. No, you're reaching too far. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. And guess who called me? Sherry Lansing. Really? Now, by the way, can you tell everybody who doesn't know who Sherry is? Oh, she was the first woman to run a studio. And she she was behind, like, Titanic. And you name, yeah, she was behind. She was a beast. (laughs) Huge. Like, behind every successful film for, like, a decade and a half. Yes. So all I'm saying is that there are times when all your friends and fans and champions who have your best interests at heart, I'm not saying they're wrong, but they are not seeing either how big you could be or the path that you're seeing through the trees or sometimes, you know, it's not a lottery ticket. Sometimes it's just luck and you reach out and and with the Sherry Lansing example, and I could give a million others it was some connection I had that I knew she would respond to. You know, Mm -hmm. you can see someone's Achilles heel. You have a tender spot in your heart that you know that that thread will connect you to them. And if you authentically speak to that, and sometimes your rage, I mean, I've had, um, you know, knock down fights, not fights, but verbal with people who I loved and adored who were, we were able to come back around. Because mm-hmm. we spoke our truth and we realized we were like kind of out of sync. Sure. And when we both heard the other person's point of view, we understood it and got it. And we got our friendship back on track and, you know, that could have been derailed. And it's the stronger friendship for it. And what are three of your favorite films of all time? Oh, for sure. I, I have to say my uh, Groundhog Day and Shawshank Redemption. I was going to say those two for sure. probably came For sure, for sure, for sure. But I'll say a couple others. Um, one of my favorites, a little teeny, teeny film, um, Waking Ned Divine. Oh, I love Waking Ned Divine. I'm in love with love Waking that Divine. movie. That is one of my all-time favorites. And um, I have to say, this won't be, th- those would be my top three. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Those are my top three. Yeah. <sighs> Heather, thank you so much for uh, for sharing uh, with the tribe and uh, dropping some very big knowledge bombs on us. It's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure having you on the show. Uh, thank you. It's my honor and my pleasure, and I hope that everyone learned something or at least had a good laugh. <laughs> Thanks. I really want to thank Heather for dropping some major knowledge bombs about the film and television markets on the tribe today. And if you guys have not had the opportunity to go to a market like AFM or CAN um, or MIPD or MIPCOM, um, definitely, if you have an opportunity, go and do it. Even if you have nothing to sell, just go and understand, talk to people, understand the process of how independent film and independent television series are sold. And the more you understand about that process and about the business of selling your product, you will be so much more successful and get to your goals faster and faster. Trust me, I learned not only a ton with This Is Meg, but I had already learned a lot about selling movies and and going through that process throughout my career. But I learned so much more just doing it with This Is Meg as well. And now with the new film, uh, On the Corner of Ego and Desire, I'm taking all that knowledge and bringing it to that project. So the more you do, the more you learn, the better it is. And I tell you, when I went to AFM, when I've gone to Toronto at their mini market, uh, there's so many uh, amazing nuggets of information you can get. So please, if you have an opportunity, do it because you will not be disappointed. If you want links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including links to Heather's book, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 240. And if you haven't already, guys, if you love the show, please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave us a five star review. It really, really helps me out a lot, helps out the, the podcast a lot to get it ranked higher, to get more people to see it and listen to this information. So please just head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave us that five star review. Thank you so much. And as always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 